this evening. Before we begin, let's pray. Almighty Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this uh, evening you've given us to study your Holy Word. I pray that as we're going to study your scriptures, uh, give us your Holy Spirit as you have promised. Uh, lead us to Jesus. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, you may convict us, that you may draw us closer to you, and that we may go away this evening knowing that Christ has spoken to us through his word. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, for our last two studies, we've been looking at how God speaks to us personally. And uh, I mean, we're really doing that because we want to know how we can grow as Christians. And uh, for us to grow as Christians, number one, we learned in our past two studies that we need to study God's word. We need to listen to God. You know, he speaks to us through nature. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through his providence. And that is how God speaks to us. We also need to talk to God. You know, uh, for any relationship to flourish, for any relationship to be strong, you know, there are some key factors. You know, there's respect. There needs to be uh, transparency. There needs to be uh, effective communication. And, you know, there are many other factors that uh, I can list. And same thing with our relationship with Jesus. Same thing with our relationship with God. You know, while God speaks to us through his word, we also need to speak to him. And that is when a relationship can be uh, built with him. I read to you this uh, quote from one of my favorite authors, W.D. Frizee, who writes, to listen while he speaks and then to talk while he listens. This is communion to listen while he speaks through his word, through providence, and then, and then to talk while he listens, this is communion. And in this communion is the secret of a life of power. You know, us talking to God is called prayer, you know, as individuals or uh, corporately as us talking to God, it's called prayer. And then, uh, you know, this author in this book, Steps to Christ, page 93, uh, you know, tells us what prayer is. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. You know, we all have close friends. We all have a family that we talk to. You know, what do we, uh, what do we tell them? We tell them anything and everything. You know, we we tell them our joys. We tell them our sorrows. We tell them uh, the victories in our life. We talk to them about the defeats in our life. Um, we share with them our sorrows. We share with them our cares, our fears, our wants. Uh, we share with them the things that we like, the things that we don't like. We just talk to them. We just talk our heart out to them. And prayer is very much the same, except that we are talking to God. And this author of this book, Steps to Christ, writes, in order to commune with God, we must have something to say to him concerning our actual life. You know, prayer is nothing but simply talking to God about our life to him, about things that matter to us and about things that really mean to us. And, uh, you know, this author writes that uh, Take to him everything that perplexes the mind. Nothing is too great for him to bear, for he holds up worlds. He rules over all the affairs of the universe. Nothing that in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. There is no chap there is no perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. No calamity can befall the least of his children. No anxiety harass the soul. No joy cheer. No sincere prayer escape, escape the lips of which our heavenly father is unobservant or the right. The relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. 
prayer is taking to God our joys, our sorrows, things that bother us, things that cause us joy, and just simply talking to him. And our Heavenly Father take notices. He's interested in all the area of our life. And our prayer to him is unique than any other prayer around us. We matter to God as individuals. We are valuable to God as individuals. And so our prayers are very much uh, uh, important to God. You know, something that really causes heartbreak to us is when we know that one of our loved ones is going through a very rough time and they tell you, you know, I'm going through a very rough time. Can you please uh, keep me in your prayers? But they don't talk to you what that rough time is. They don't tell you what's really going on. You see, that, that's really hard, you know. It's good that, they, that they're telling us that they're going through a rough time and that we ought to pray for them. But sometimes we wish they could just talk to us and see if we can help them. And that's the same thing with God. You know, when we go through problems in life, when we go through suffering in life, you know, God waits for us to talk to him. God waits for us to talk to him. Now, the greatest example of, uh, of a prayerful life is Jesus himself. I will read to you a few verses which, um, which supports what I just said. Uh, Matthew chapter 14 and verse 23 tells us, And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. Mark chapter 1 and verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. This is talking about Jesus. Then we find in Luke chapter 5 and verse 16. And he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Final verse about Jesus' prayer life. Luke chapter 6 and verse 12. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Jesus, he left all the glories of heaven. He left the throne of heaven. And he incarnated and he came to this earth as a human being, just like you and I. He put on divine nature. I mean, he put on human nature. He covered his divine nature with human nature. And then every single day, as he ministered to people, every single day as he met people, every single day he healed people and preached and taught and trained. He did not stick with that but he also felt the importance of prayer in his own life. He also saw the importance of talking to God, talking to God about his ministry here on this earth, talking to God about things that break his heart, things that has caused joy to him. Taking time and spending time with God was important for Jesus himself. How much more should you and I Understand how important it is for us to pray if Jesus himself prayed. Not just that, when Jesus was on this earth, we will see in a few moments that he taught his disciples how to pray. He directed them how to present their daily needs before God, how to cast all their cares upon him. And this lesson that he taught his disciples of then applies to you and me today, applies to you and me today. This uh, author of the book, Steps to Christ, writes, His humanity made prayer a necessity and a privilege. He found comfort and joy in communion with his Father. And if the Son of Men, the Son of God, felt the need of prayer, how much more should feeble, sinful mortals should feel the necessity of fervent, constant prayer? No, there is so there's a lot that we can talk about prayer, um, but what we're doing is just scratching the surface about the importance of prayer in our Christian growth. Importance of prayer to our Christian growth. And the Bible tells us, it, the Bible actually invites us to pray. 
in uh, Psalm chapter 17 and verse 6, the Bible says, I have called upon you. This is David talking. I have called upon you and you will hear me. O God, incline your ear to me and hear my speech. Psalm 116 verses 1 and 2 tells, I love the Lord. Why? Because he has heard my voice and my supplications because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore, will I call upon him as long as I live. You know, as human beings, we want to express what's within our heart. And there is something about expressing that deepens uh, what is already in our heart. When we express something to someone, we just feel like a burden has been taken off our shoulders. There is something about expressing uh, the things that uh, happening happens within our hearts and minds. And God calls us. God invites us. Pray. You can come to me. I'm a God who listens to your prayers. You know, what does prayer presuppose? Prayer presupposes, writes one author, uh, prayer presupposes faith that God is, that he hears, that he cares, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Four things to pray. Uh, when we pray to God, we presuppose four things. We presuppose that there is a God in heaven that we are going to pray to. Second, Prayer presupposes that he not only exists out there, but he is someone who inclines his ear, someone who listens to us, someone who hears us. Number third, prayer presupposes that God cares about what we're saying to him. And number four, it presupposes that he will do something about what we tell him. He will do something about what we tell him. It assumes, writes the author, uh, that a right relation exists between the suppliant and God, or that such a relationship is to be restored. Ideally, prayer is, an, is any out, outgoing of the soul toward God, expressing love and appreciation, the desire for divine guidance, the confession of sin, or particular requests. Its purpose it's not so much to effect a change in God as to effect one in the suppliant and to condition the mind and life of the petitioner so that God may accomplish his infinite will in and through him. Pray. No, we don't pray to change God's mind. We pray for our lives to be aligned with God's will. And we're talking about you no know, way marks of salvation. We're talking about what it means to grow as a Christian, what it means to uh, uh, mature as a Christian, prayer, my friends, when we pray to God, we are not telling God, God, you have to change your mind according to what I want to do. Instead, prayer is laying hold of the divine arm that God may change us into his image. God may change us into his image. And hence, because of this presupposition that God exists, that God hears us and that God cares about us and that he will do something about what we tell him. The Bible admonishes us, rather the Bible invites us in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. The Bible is inviting us to go boldly before the throne of grace. Now let's go to get into the practicality of uh, prayer life. Number one, the Bible talks to us about the importance of uh, corporate prayer. Importance of corporate prayer. We find here in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. And just to give you a context of what's happening in Acts 1. Jesus ascended uh, to heaven from the, uh, from the Mount Olivet. And he told, tells his disciples... He gives them the gospel commission and tells his disciples, you know, I want you to go back to Jerusalem. Tarry in Jerusalem until you receive power and then start from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria unto the uttermost ends of the earth. And as a result of uh, 
Christ telling that the disciples gathered together in the upper room. And we find in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, corporate prayer that happens. It says, these all continued with one accord in prayer, that is the disciples, and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. The Bible says that they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. The Bible is giving to us an example of a corporate prayer. The Christian church, as we can see it here, it began with prayer. It was bathed in prayer. And there was a revival movement that started in the first century because of prayer. The Holy Spirit was poured out because of prayer. My friends, the Christian church can continue to retain the power that Christ promised only through prayer, only through corporate prayer, as the scripture tells us. Let me thank God for ministry like Final Herald, where we not only study God's word, but know in the end, we gather prayer requests and we pray to God. We tell him, we keep before him all our joys, our sorrows, our praises before him. Prayer, public prayer or corporate prayer is important. Not just that, the Bible also talks to us about the importance of family worship or family prayer. In fact, we find uh, Abraham... Uh, as an example of this. Let's read a few verses about this, about Abraham as the example of uh, a family worship. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, the Bible says, Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Moreh. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. Now notice, and there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Also, we find another instance uh, as a, uh, Abram continued to move from place to place. In Genesis chapter 13 and verse 18, the Bible says, Then Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron. Now notice, and there he built an altar to the Lord. What we find here is an example of Abram. Wherever he goes, he's building an altar to the Lord. He is commanding his household. To worship the true God of heaven. To worship the true God of heaven. And one um, Bible commentator writes, uh, uh, talking about Abram and, and uh, family worship, uh, the altar that Abram built wherever he went. This is what uh, this Bible commentator writes. Like the patriarchs of old, those who profess to love God should erect an altar to the Lord wherever they pitch their tent. If ever there was a time when every house should be a house of prayer, it is now. Fathers and mothers should often lift up their hearts to God in humble supplication for themselves and their children. Let the father, as priest of the household, lay upon the altar of God the morning and evening sacrifice, while the wife and children unite in prayer and prayers. In such a household, Jesus will love to tarry. We ought to learn from the uh, patriarchs. You know, wherever they went, they erected an altar to the Lord. They pointed people to, they pointed their family members, they pointed their spouses and their kids and their extended relatives and friends to God they worship both morning and evening. In fact, what happened is, um, to take a small detour, after Abram erects all these altars wherever he went, there are commentators who write that uh, the pagans would come across these altars and they would be pointed to the God of heaven. They would be pointed to the God of heaven. The importance of family worship. The importance of family worship. And I know this by personal experience that one of the greatest impact that fathers and mothers can leave or impression that they can leave in the hearts of their young people is to have worship morning and evening, 
is to have worship morning and evening to let the kids know that our house functions because that there is a God in heaven who cares about us and who hears our prayer. And so we find the importance of corporate worship where we come together with our church family, where we come together as Christian believers and we pray. Second, we find the importance of family worship, morning and evening family worship. Finally, importance of personal prayer. Nothing can substitute this. We find in Matthew chapter 6, and uh, actually let me read to you more than verse 6. So Matthew chapter 6. You can turn your Bible there. Matthew chapter 6, and starting from uh, verse 5, verse 5 and 6 and 7. It says, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now notice verse 6, in contrast to what they're doing. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, Pray to, the fa pray to thy father, which is in secret, and thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, do not use, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. The point I want you to notice there, I like how also the New King James puts it, it tells, but when you, but you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. The importance of secret prayer, the importance of personal prayer, this personal prayer, this secret prayer, where it's only you and God talking, where it's only you pouring out your heart to God, your emotions to God. This is the life of the soul. And when we neglect secret prayer, our soul becomes destitute. We lose power in our Christianity. Our religion becomes just a formal routine. Just a formal routine. You know, the Bible invites us that we need to pray personally. You know, this one author writes, there is no time or place in which it is inappropriate to offer up a petition to God. There is nothing that can prevent us from lifting up our hearts in the spirit of earnest prayer. In the crowds of the street, in the midst of a business engagement, we may send up a petition to God and plead for divine guidance. As did Nehemiah when he made his request before King Artaxerxes. A closet of communion may be found wherever we are. We should have the door of the heart open continually and our invitation going up that Jesus may come and abide as a heavenly guest in the soul. So it's important that we pray privately. And uh, there are many, many times in my own personal life that I've seen when things are too overwhelming, when things are too confusing and not able to make sense of what's going on around, the place of comfort, the place of peace that I found myself in is just me and God, just pouring out my heart to him, just pouring out my emotions to God, not hiding anything, expressing whatever is going on within the heart. My friends, there's nothing in the world like secret prayer talking to God as to a friend, opening up about everything in your life. There is nothing else. There is no other place that I could find such comfort and such peace like personal prayer. And so we find the importance of corporate prayer. We find the importance of uh, family prayer. We also find the importance of personal prayer. No more can we say about this but we're just scratching the surface. Now I want to look at what are some conditions for answered prayer. Now maybe someone is saying, John, I've been praying for years, but I just feel like I don't have answered prayers. I don't have answered prayers. 
there are a few conditions. In fact, let me see. I want to share with you seven conditions for answered prayer. Seven conditions for answered prayer. First, we need to feel our need of God. The Bible writes in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thy offspring. The Bible writes that I will pour water upon what kind of a land? I mean, upon whom? Upon him that is thirsty and floods upon dry ground. I mean, dry ground needs water. If we are thirsty, we need water. And so similarly, we need to understand, we need to feel the need of God in our life. We need to understand the need of God in our lives. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, it says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, and the Bible promises, for they shall be filled. For they shall be filled. I've seen many, many times in uh, day-to-day life and in the life of uh, friends and family, how oftentimes we don't think much about God when things are going well. You know, we don't Turn to God when things are going well. A pandemic, we are turning to God, we're asking, we're praying to him, God, please help us. We don't know what we've done. Please save us. Or something else happens, something tragic happens in our life. We think about God more than ever before. And it's very unfortunate, you know, that it's only in times of need that we turn to God. But all those things are just pointers. God sometimes allows certain situations and circumstances and trials in our life to, to help us understand how much we need him in our life. We forget to pray when things are going right. We forget to pray when our bank balance is high. If they're doing and having a nice time, but when something tragic happens, we turn to God. My friends, what we need to understand is prayer is more than just a first aid kit. Prayer, yes, of course, you know, in times of trouble, in times of sorrow, uh, we can go to God immediately and he answers our prayers, but prayer is more than just in the time of trouble. Prayer is important every single day. Talking to God is important every single day. I mean, uh, if you take, for example, relationships. Um, I was just thinking how to put it this way because I'm not married, but you observe uh, marriage relationships. There needs to be communication between a husband and a wife for that relationship to stay strong, for that relationship to uh, be smooth, talk things through every day and do it often. And same thing with the relationship with Jesus. We need to talk to God every day and need to do it more often. So number one, condition for answered prayer. We need to understand the need of God in our life. Second, we need to have a repentant heart. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 66 and verse 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. What does the psalmist write? If I have a sin that I'm cherishing, a known sin that I'm cherishing, that I'm harboring, the Bible says that God will not hear me. God will not listen to my prayers. Why? James chapter 4 and verse 3. He ask and receive not. Because he ask amiss, that is, you're asking wrongly, that he may consume it upon your lusts. And I'm going to be a little vulnerable, a vulnerable here. I remember in my college, um, second year of my college, you know, there was uh, uh, there was uh, there was a particular relationship that I was uh, quite interested in. And I remember pouring out my heart to God and asking God and claiming his promise, God, please give this relationship. I'm so interested. And 
during that time, God impressed upon my own heart this particular verse. You know, you ask, but you don't receive this because you're probably asking the wrong thing. You're probably asking the wrong examples. You know, sometimes we ask God, you know, if a child is asking um, for a lot of unhealthy food, you know, say that you're going to, um, to this particular fair and then your child is asking, oh, mom, please buy me cotton candy. And okay, you buy them the first cotton candy. And then as time go by, you know, they're enjoying all the rides and they're, uh, you know, they're having a lot of fun and they're like, mom, can you please buy me cotton candy again? They keep asking you for cotton candy. You know that cotton candy is not good for you because of the amount of sugar that's loaded in it. And so you're not going to give it to them, right? And it's the same thing with God. Yes, cotton candy may taste good, but it's not good for us. In a similar fashion, we pray to God, but God sometimes does not answer our prayer because it is not good for us because it is not good for us because we have something within us to to change his mind to please our um, carnal nature and god won't do that because that is not good for you and me but if we come to god if we acknowledge god look i'm a sinner i really love this sin i I enjoy this sin and my desire is for you to give me this particular request that I have. I know it is wrong. This is my desire, but please change my desire. God, please change me. When we have a repentant heart to come to God, acknowledge um, the thing that we are struggling in. My friends, the Bible tells us that God will listen to our prayers. God will listen to the prayer of the righteous, the Bible writes. And so if we regard iniquity in our hearts, if we cling to any known sin, the Lord will not hear us. But the prayer of the penitent, contrite soul is always accepted. And then the author writes, when all known wrongs are righted, we may believe that God will answer our petitions. Our own merit will never commend us to the favor of God. It is the worthiness of Jesus that will save us. His blood that will cleanse us. Yet we have a work to do in complying with the conditions of acceptance. So the first condition of answered prayer is to feel our need for God. The second condition of answered prayer is to have a repentant heart if we are cherishing sin in our life. Number three, this is key, faith. We need to have faith when we pray to God. Hebrews chapter 11 Hebrews chapter 11 is a great chapter on faith. And verse 6 tells us, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The Bible says that if we come to God, we must believe that he is. And that he will reward them that diligently seek him. Mark chapter 11 and verse 24 tells us, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. The Bible tells us to have faith. The Bible tells us to have faith in God, faith in God's promises that he will provide what we ask him. In fact, I want to read to you a verse that I've probably... I read this before, but it's probably one of my favorite verses about God's promises in, um, in 2 Timothy. Uh, sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3, 4, 3 and 4. It tells us, according as his divine power, according to whose divine power? God's divine power, Peter writes, hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge. Who's writing this? This is Peter writing. Peter was one of the closest disciples of Jesus. 
And Peter knows what it means to experience God's divine power. Because he was with Jesus when he calmed the stormy sea, he saw God's divine power. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, he saw God's divine power. When Jesus multiplied the bread and fish, he, got, he saw God's divine power. When Jesus healed the blind, he, got, he saw God's divine power. When Jesus healed the man with the pool of Bethesda, he saw God's divine power. Peter has beheld God's divine power in the life and ministry of Jesus. And Peter is writing that according to his divine power, he has given us all things. That is, he has given you and me all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Do we have different needs in our life? We certainly have different needs in our life. And godliness, Peter writes. Do we need strength to overcome temptation? Do we need power to grow in Christ? We certainly do. And Peter writes, God has provided his promise for our life and for our Christian growth according to his divine power. Verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. According to God's divine power, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And by claiming the great and precious promises of God, we can partake, we can experience that divine power that Peter beheld when he was alive. You know, my friends, when we talk about the importance of faith in prayer, it is not faith in my prayer. It is not faith in my vocabulary as to how well I can express my heart to God but rather it is a faith in God that he exists out there, that he listens to us, that he cares about us, and he will do something about what we are praying to. And my friends, we ought to have faith in Bible promises and amazing, amazing ways to mark up your Bible with Bible promises and claim God's promises for every situation of our life. Claim God's promises for the every situation of our life. A preacher once said that when he's traveling, uh, you know, on speaking engagements, that he would have a very special wallet. And that this special wallet would have different cards in it. It would have a card for car rental. It will have a car for his hotel. It will have a car for his health insurance card, his uh, ministry, uh, minister's license card, and just different types of card for different situations in the Bible is something like that, where it has different promises for different situations of our life. And the Bible invites us to come to him, come to God in faith, come to God having faith in his promises that God will fulfill his promise. Believe. And we've talked about faith except for in this series. So for God, condition number two, we need to have a repentant heart if we are cherishing sin. Condition number three, we ought to have faith when we come to God in prayer. Condition number four, perseverance. Says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. No, we need to persevere in prayer. We need to persevere. We should not give up praying. We find in, uh, you know, in Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13, uh, we don't have time to go through the entire parable, but it's a parable of the friend calling at midnight. You know, he's there is this particular friend who has a guest that has come in. He doesn't have food in his house. So he goes to his friend and then he asks him for bread. And the friend tells him, you know, this is too late in the night. Why are you asking for bread now? My family is asleep. I cannot get up and give it to you. But this friend kept insisting, telling, you know, please give me bread. Please give me bread. I have a guest who is coming. I don't have food in the house. 
And that friend eventually who was sleeping gets up and gives this other friend bread because he was persistent. Because he was persistent. You know, when we are persistent, it shows how much of a desire, how much of a value we have towards it. But we also need to understand, uh, actually we'll come to that principle a little later on. But so the fourth uh, condition to prayer is persistence and diligence, persistence and diligence. The fifth condition to prayer, Matthew chapter six and verse 12. Now this is the Lord's prayer tells and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, when we ask God for mercy, when we ask God for forgiveness, the Bible tells us that we should have forgiven our own enemies first. You know, if we expect our own prayers to be heard, we must forgive the others in the same manner and to the same extent we hope to be forgiven for our sins. Okay, so there may be people in your life that you may not have forgiven. God wants you to forgive. You know, God has shown you and me mercy when we did not deserve mercy. When we did the vilest thing, but God still forgave us. God still wants to forgive us to the complete extent. And God tells us that if we want, if we expect our prayers to be answered, we need to forgive the people that offend us. We need to forgive the people that offend us. Sixth condition, pray in the name of Jesus. Pray in the name of Jesus. John chapter 15 and verse 16 tells us, he Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And then it tells that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Ask, my, ask the Father in my name. John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Why is it that we need to ask in the name of Jesus? You know, you and I are sinners. We don't, des we don't deserve anything good. We don't deserve blessings of life. We deserve eternal separation from God for the way that we have handled ourselves, for the choices we've made, for the way we treat one another, we don't deserve anything good. But it is because of the cross of Calvary that grace was shed upon us. It was because of the, grub of the cross of Calvary that you and I have all the blessings in the world that pours towards us. It is because of the cross of Calvary. It is because of what Jesus did for you and me. So my friends, the first condition for prayer is for us to feel our need for God. The second condition is to have a repentant heart, not to cherish any particular sin. Number three, have faith in God and in his promises when we pray. The fourth condition for answered prayer is persist in prayer. Persist in prayer. The fifth condition is forgive people that have offended you. Forgive, your, forgive the people that have... Uh, that have wronged you in the same way that God has forgiven you. The sixth condition is to pray in the name of Jesus. I also like how this one author writes that to pray in the name of Jesus is something more than a mere mention of that name at the beginning and at the ending of a prayer. It is to pray in the mind and in the spirit of Jesus while we believe his promises, rely upon his grace and work his work. We pray with the mind of Jesus, with the spirit of Jesus. And you know, studying the prayer life of Jesus is an amazing experience, but that's for another time. Uh, condition number seven. This is probably very key. Just as, any, uh, just as the others are a key point. First John chapter five and verse 14, it tells us, and this is the confidence that we have in him. Where's the confidence? Not in us, not in my ability, not in my prayer, not in my vocabulary, but the confidence is in Christ that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we pray according to his will, he hears us. 
no, I, I uh, earlier talk, talk, spoke to you about persisting in prayer. You know, all this needs to come under God if this is your will. If this is your will. The same thing that I mentioned earlier goes. You know, this is maybe something is not God's will for us. And we want God, uh, rather, uh, we want something that's not good for us, but God has the best interest for you and me in mind. And his will is the best will for you and me. And so when we pray or God's will, we can do it another time. But these are the seven conditions for answered prayer. So in closing, I want to look at uh, the Lord's Prayer. It's a very famous prayer in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. And this is Jesus teaching his disciples to pray. And he tells, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus is giving here a pattern of prayer. How do we understand this pattern of prayer? I like how um, Pastor Mark Finley puts it. He talking about the Lord's Prayer. Uh, in his recent sermon about the Lord's Prayer, a powerful sermon, he tells the Lord's Prayer is divided, divided into two sections. Okay, The Lord's Prayer is divided into two sections of three petitions each. Each section has three petitions. The first three petitions have to do with God and the glory of God. What are the first three petitions? Let's look at it. Uh, Matthew 6 and verse 9. Our Father, which art in heaven, first petition, Hello, uh, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, uh, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So the first petition is hallowed be thy name. The second petition is thy kingdom come. And the third petition is thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Three petitions. The Lord's Prayer can be divided into two sections, and each section has three petitions. In the first section, the three petitions are, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on this earth. Then the second uh, section has three petitions. What are those three petitions? Give us this day our daily bread. Number two, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Number three, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Three petitions. The first three petitions, like I said, have to do with God and the glory of God. The second three petitions have to do with our needs and necessity of life. And then he continues, when God is given his proper place, all things fall into place. In other words, God is given his supreme place, his glory and honor consume our life. And then, and only then, do we present him our desires and our needs. Powerful, powerful. The Bible tells us to address the Father as our Father, which art in heaven. You know, God is all powerful but yet, he asks us to call him our father. He's personal. Although God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, yet he's personal that you and I can approach him just like we can approach our father. And this father not only understands us, but he will do something about what we care and what we need. And so first, God invites us to 
Jesus invites us to call his father, our father, to approach God who is all powerful, who is all knowing and ever present to approach him because he is our father. And then the first petition, he tells, hallowed be thy name. Talks about God's character. You know, name in Bible, it's equal to character because we find um, in Exodus chapter 33 and 34, you know, Moses is talking to God and God is saying, I will, uh, I will proclaim my name before you. And then when he's proclaiming, he's saying, the Lord God is good and merciful, just and righteous. He's faithful, slow to anger. He's talking about character. And so name is equal to character. Name is equal to character. So when we are praying to God, hallowed be thy name. We are praying that our inmost thoughts, our conscious acts, our spoken words will reflect the loving character of God. And then it says, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. No, we need God's kingdom, not only in the future, but we want that kingdom today. The Bible talks about uh, two faces of God's kingdom on this earth. The kingdom of grace and the kingdom of glory. The kingdom of grace was established when Jesus died for us on the cross. And the kingdom of glory is at the second coming of Jesus. And so when the Bible tells thy kingdom come, it's talking about the kingdom of grace that we need in our personal hearts, that we need in our family, and also about hastening the kingdom of glory, which is still in the future. That is the second petition in the first section. And then the third one, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We spoke earlier about the importance of praying according to God's will. When we come to God, Jesus is saying through the Lord's prayer, we are telling God, I, I don't know what to do in my life. I want your will to be done in my life. I want your will to be done in my family's life, in my children's life, in my church's life. First, I want your character to be reflected through me. Second, I want the kingdom of grace in my heart and I want to hasten your kingdom of glory that is to come. Number three, I want your will to be done in my life. And then when we have given God his proper place, like Pastor Mark Finley said, and then we preserve us this day our daily bread. God providing for our daily needs. Do we all have daily needs? Do we need food on the table? Do we need clothing? Do we need to pay our bills? We certainly do. And now we present our daily needs to God. And then the second petition in the, sec uh, the second section. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. We ask God for forgiveness. And number three, the third uh, petition is lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. You know, God is not, this is not talking about uh, temptation as in God tempting you to go steal or God tempting you to go, uh, you know, uh, do something wrong. But rather, this is talking about test. You know, God sometimes allows trials and temptations to come to our life. And we're asking God for strength to face those trials and temptations. And that is what this Third petition in the second section talks about. And then the Lord's prayer ends. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so the Lord's prayer is an example to us of acknowledging God for who he is. And after recognizing who he is to us, and then to present our needs, our supplication before him. And so in closing, I want to challenge you. you know, last week, we saw the importance of prayer, of uh, Bible study. But this week, I don't know what your prayer life is. But I want to challenge you. Make it a habit to talk to God. Uh, you know, Jesus had a time to pray. You know, the Bible tells that he went early in the morning. He prayed all night. Jesus had a time to pray. Number, In the same way, choose a time for you to spend time with God. Maybe it's in the morning. Maybe it's in the evening. You're just praying to God. 
you're reading the Bible, you're claiming God's promises, and you're praying to God in the morning, segregate it. Start with 10 minutes. Start with whatever you can and increase. And then choose a place to pray. It may be by your bedside. It may be in your living room. I don't know where. Maybe in your backyard. I don't know where. A place where it's just you and God pouring out your innermost soul to him. A time to pray and a place to pray just like Jesus does. And prayer, it doesn't have to be restricted only to those times. When you're working, a bad thought passes through your mind. You can talk to God and tell God, please help me. You know, Peter, when he was sinking, he said, Lord, save me. Short prayer. And the Lord saved him. Just like you would like to talk to a friend, every chance that we get, talk to God. He waits to listen to you speak. So I challenge you, whatever your prayer life is, begin wherever you are to spend time with him. Let God talk to you through his word. And may you talk to him through prayer. God bless you and have a good evening.